Um, in terms of uh, an overview uh, today, I wanted to touch on uh, the fact that there are three disorders that have very similar symptoms. Vestibular migraine, which we won't talk about today, superior canal dehiscence, and perilymph fistula. Uh, also, we'll uh, have a, a short um, overview of a study that uh, was recently published in the journal Otology and Neurotology about a non-auditory uh, test system for uh, evoking CVEMPs and OVEMPs. Um, well, the perspective here is really odd, so I apologize for being a little bit awkward, so I'm just going to be able to uh, gain a better perspective. So Lloyd Minor in 1998 was the first one to recognize uh, superior canal dehiscence, uh, although Rick Cole in 1992 um, described it in an operative report during a middle fossa vestibular nerve section, but he did not make the association, um, which I was happy to point out to Rick uh, later uh, as I assumed the care of uh, this patient. But Lloyd recognized that sound and, and or pressure-induced vertigo, oscillopsy, and disequilibrium could occur. Uh, in 2005, in an updated uh, series, recognized a conductive uh, hearing loss component, which has uh, now been uh, uh, pro um, more commonly known as a pseudoconductive uh, hearing loss, and also lower vestibular evoked myogenic potential thresholds. Dennis Poe's group in Boston in 2005 uh, was the first to describe autophony symptoms, the ability to hear internal sounds abnormally well. Um, uh, another thing that I forgot to mention uh, during the panel discussion, which um, Manohar touched on, was the use of low-frequency tuning forks uh, in the exam room. And any otic capsule defect, uh, well, most otic capsule defects, whether they're a superior canal dehiscence or a perilymph fistula, if you apply a low-frequency tuning fork, and I use a 250 56 hertz uh, tuning fork and apply it to the patient's knees and elbows, uh, very often they'll be able to hear or feel that uh, in their head, which is obvi obviously uh, not normal, but it's a very inexpensive uh, screening tool. Uh, Pose group again in 2007 uh, characterized superior canal dehiscence as the great otologic mimicker uh, with autophony and a blocked ear or the interlymphatic hydrops type symptoms in 94% of patients, the pseudoconductive hearing loss in 86% of patients in his particular series. University of Michigan group uh, was the first in 2009 to uh, describe interlymphatic hydrops in superior canal dehiscence patients, and uh, this was present in 14 of 15 ears. They only operated four and all four of those patients had resolution of their uh, high drops. And with superior canal dehiscence, it's really more a spectrum than it is a syndrome. Uh, patients have, to varying degrees, a number of different uh, symptoms. Uh, sensitivity to loud sounds, they can experience tilting or rocking type of sensations, nausea, uh, dizziness, they'll describe uh, pain. Uh, patients can fall, their legs buckling out from under them. Spatial disorientation is very common. Uh, they will hear internal sounds quite well, heartbeat, pulse, breathing, heel strikes, eyes moving, uh, even chewing can be very very troublesome. I had one woman that quit going to church because she would sit in a wooden pew and could hear the bowel sounds of the person next to her, which uh, I'm sure was quite disturbing. And they'll have cognitive dysfunction. Uh, they uh, will also have uh, ear pressure and fullness. Uh, many patients will also have barometric uh, pressure sensitivity. Uh, hearing loss, which is uh, typically the uh, pseudoconductive uh, type of hearing loss, uh, tinnitus, light sensitivity, and headache. And uh, also, many of these patients have been diagnosed with migraine or have been managed as migraine patients. Uh, since February of 2010, I've operated 55 ears uh, for superior canal dehiscence. Um, the uh, decision for surgery surgery in addition to the patient's uh, decision was based on clinical and radiographic features. Also, many of these patients failed to respond to medical management, and some of the patients uh, would present early on as a vestibular migraine type of uh, patient, and only as their symptoms evolved uh, did it occur to me to get a CT scan and determine that they, in fact, had a superior canal dehiscence. But it also led to a structured interview uh, that I perform on patients before and after surgery regarding their symptoms symptomatology, which is really just a tool to remind me to ask specific questions uh, of patients. And I've uh, done all of these through a classic middle fossa approach. It takes uh, me about two hours uh, from start to finish to, uh, to do this. Um, typically, uh, based on the size and position of the superior canal dehiscence, it'll either be plugged or resurfaced. And then I use uh, ceramic cement to uh, resurface the skull base. Uh, the other aspect
aspect that's common in these patients, especially uh, women in their 50s with this disorder, is they'll have other temporal bone defects with their temporal lobe herniating uh, through the uh, defect. And so this is also uh, reconstructed at the same time, and then a small cranioplasty to repair the skull defect. I was just going to touch on uh, one specific uh, case briefly, uh, just because of the interest of, uh, of this child. A uh, six-year-old boy, long-standing history of sound and wind-induced otalgia. Uh, when he would chew, it was really bothersome to him. He would cry frequently. Uh, uh, otolaryngologists attributed this to otitis media had tubes placed, uh, did not help. He was admitted to a, a hospital uh, in 2010 and had a very expensive uh, workup and the MR and CT were interpreted as normal, although the CT scan that they uh, performed showed the dehiscence in his right uh, superior canal. But he left the hospital with a diagnosis of adjustment uh, disorder with anxiety and also obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. And his mother was counseled to quit providing inappropriate uh, reward uh, for his pain behaviors. Uh, he would become ataxic and, uh, and would walk with a broad gaze, a gait after loud sound exposures. Uh, he could hear his heartbeat, breathing, chewing in his right ear only. With loud sounds, he'd experience tilting, nausea, uh, dizziness, his ear would hurt, uh, falls and disorientation were things that happened. Uh, he had cognitive uh, disruption uh, with impaired concentration and foggy thinking. Uh, this picture tells the tale, but uh, Seamus would uh, cry even at birthday parties when they were singing happy birthday uh, to him, but he appeared ill. He had right head tilt, no torticollis, uh, covered his right ear with his hand, otologic examination normal. His uh, Sharp and Romberg was positive. With his uh, computerized dynamic posturography, he had evidence of a severe vestibular deficit type of postural discontrol, fell in all the trials of the more complicated uh, sensory organization tests five and six. Um, also uh, had uh, se uh, severe sensory disorganization pattern and uh, somatosensory dependency. And a center of gra gravity alignment was distributed randomly, uh, which is uh, seen in abnormal otolithic uh, input. And here you can see three-dimensional reconstructions of his, uh, his uh, left um, uh, superior canal appearing normal, and then his right with the, uh, the defects that you can see here, and also intraoperatively, and uh, there after the ceramic cement was placed. And this was his preoperative appearance on the left, and one week after surgery, uh, this was him with a big smile, hands out the window of the car with the wind blowing past uh, his ear, and he remains a, a normal boy as he's uh, developing. Um, so in conclusion regarding uh, SCD, these phenotypes are really a spectrum rather than a syndrome. Uh, many of these patients have lymphatic hydrops, which also resolves uh, with treatment uh, typically. Uh, some cases uh, suggest a congenital defect, others are uh, progressive and, uh, and acquired, and it's important to maintain a high level of uh, suspicion in approaching all of these uh, patients, and especially if you've managed them as a vestibular migraine patient and all medical management has uh, failed. So next I wanted to turn to perilymph fistula, and indeed uh, it is a controversial area, area and uh, even though Victor Goodhill was one of the people uh, who um, was a resource when I was a resident at UCLA, um, I was taught that perilymph fistulas didn't exist, and I think there's a whole generation of us that, uh, that were the same way, but uh, Goodhill uh, was the first to really categorize these as implosive or explosive, uh, but the concept of having uh, barometric pressure applied to the inner ear uh, was the thought behind how these uh, developed. And there are a number of other supporting clinical features uh, regarding the relationship to trauma, uh, exacerbation with physical activity, and improvement with restricting uh, physical activity are supporting features. And there are uh, certainly many people uh, that, uh, that don't believe in perilymph fistulas. This is John Shea, uh, quote from an article that he wrote uh, in uh, Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery in 1992. And in fact, I actually gave a paper, uh, presented a paper in 1993 called Perilymphatic Fistula, Science, Religion, or Both. And uh, the subsequent uh, review paper was definitely uh, skewed toward the side of, of, uh, of uh, there not being 
paralympic fistulas or at least if they're very rare. So again, these uh, spectrum symptoms that you see with superior canal dehiscence, I've come to understand that you can see this also in perilymph fistula patients. And right now, I've uh, recently analyzed seven patients that, uh, that I've had uh, that looked exactly like superior canal dehiscence patients. And in fact, I was so smug in, in the initial evaluation that I was convinced that that's what it was, got the CT scan only to find out that there was no dehiscence uh, for these uh, patients on their scan. Um, so their preoperative findings, pseudoconductive hearing loss, all of them had this. Uh, they would hear the, the low-frequency tuning fork uh, in their head when applied to extremities in 71%, autophony 71%. Uh, three of them could hear their eyes move. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, many people talk about is pathognomonic of the superior canal dehiscence is being able to hear their eyes move, uh, but three of these patients could do that as well. Uh, failed vestibular migraine patient, uh, management was common. Uh, history of trauma, uh, likewise uh, common. Uh, severe headache, light sensitivity, and cognitive dysfunction, uh, very uh, characteristic of this. And many of these patients have been managed for years uh, by neurologists. In fact, I've got a short video that I'll show in a moment of a young woman that uh, was thought to have benign uh, intracranial hypertension. And so she actually went uh, underwent a ventricular peritoneal shunt uh, placement uh, not only once but twice because the first time it didn't resolve her headaches and, uh, and they were convinced that it may have been a misfunctioning uh, shunt and so she had that uh, done again uh, and uh, you'll see that in a moment. And so in the center, you can see the uh, right and left superior canals for all seven of these patients. Uh, on your panel on the left is an example. These patients, uh, some of these patients can also have VIMPs that look very similar to a uh, superior canal dehiscence patient. So the same otic capsule uh, 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 phenomenon that will uh, abnormally stimulate their, um, their uh, otolithic organs uh, can happen in perilymph fistula. So you can see the, the preoperative, uh, with a very high amplitude, uh, poor wave morphology, but uh, lower uh, vent thresholds, and uh, postoperatively a reduced amplitude, uh, but still abnormal uh, threshold here, but uh, certainly different than the preoperative appearance. Mm. And so here's a, a short um, video, which hopefully will start. And while we're getting the sound up, it, all these patients will appear ill, uncomfortable, uh, have difficulty even stringing words together when they're talking. I started getting headaches back again, so I came to see Dr. Wackham. And the dizziness is just insane. It's hard to walk um, from point A to point B without being extremely dizzy. Um, my ears constantly ringing and throbbing and um, oh, I my, turn of thought. my eyes hurt um, it's hard to concentrate on and I forget what I'm always talking about um, so whenever I hear loud sounds um, I get really nauseous and even more dizzy and I can't concentrate um, I can hear my eyes move. Um, my eyes are hard to focus on things. Okay, so today is the day after surgery and I feel a hundred bucks better, a million bucks at that. Um, I'm not light sensitive anymore and the window shade's actually open. Um, I'm not dizzy. The only thing is, is you know, the ear feels full, which is to be normal. Um, I can remember a lot more for the most part. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Their cognitive dysfunction takes a while to. Uh, no, to uh, I'm not light sensitive anymore, and my headaches are gone, and the dizziness is gone. So, huge, huge improvement. Uh, it'll be nice when the fullness goes away, but other than that, I feel a hundred times better. 
and before the surgery I could actually hear my eyes move and I no longer can and I am no longer nauseous and dizzy. Okay, so today is about five weeks after my surgery and I feel great. I do not hear my eyes moving. I do not have any headaches. Um, my life, I feel like, is getting back on track slowly but surely. Um, I know I still got to get somewhat easy because I don't want to overdo it and injure myself. But all in all, I do feel better. And um, I don't have the ringingness either in my ear. Um, what else? Oh, my cognitive is slowly getting better. Um, I would say it's a lot better than from few weeks ago, even though I can't remember everything, but it's gotten better. You have three minutes left, Dr. Wicking. So it's been three start. months since my PLF surgery, and I feel amazing. Best I've felt in two years. I no longer hear my eyes move or my heart beat in my ears. I am back to work after two years, which is pretty amazing. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. Uh, but with these uh, patients, it's amazing how the next morning the light sensitivity and headaches uh, goes away uh, with it. And many of these patients had had those symptoms for several years. And uh, in all of these patients, I've uh, followed uh, with a minimum of uh, six months uh, follow-up and have tried to do uh, videos uh, for most of them. And uh, I'll just refer you to um, this, uh, this paper that was published recently if you'd like to uh, learn more about the OVIMP-CVIMP uh, project that we've uh, worked on. Thank you.